Well, as always, church, it is good to be with you. For those who may be new or visiting, uh, my name is Tyler David. I'm the downtown campus pastor and one of the preaching pastors here at the Austin Stone. Uh, today we'll be in the Gospel of Mark, and we'll be finishing up our sermon series called Normal Christianity. Like we always do at the Austin Stone, we're preaching verse by verse through the book of the Bible, and we have this series called Normal Christianity to kind of capture this unique section in the Gospel of Mark, this unique section where Jesus is teaching his disciples what it means to follow him, what it means to know him. He's teaching them what normal Christianity looks like, not extraordinary Christianity, not varsity Christianity, but normal Christianity. And for our last lesson together in this series, in this section of Mark's Gospel, we're going to learn this. We're going to learn that normal Christianity is knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And normal Christianity is knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And normal Christianity is not first and foremost about the church you're a part of, or your personality, or your moral attitude, or your political leaning. It is first and foremost about knowing God through Christ. We have a relationship where we know Jesus as Lord and Savior, not generally, but specifically as Lord and Savior. See, throughout the New Testament, the, the common terminology for Jesus and his people is that he is their Lord and their Savior. And how you see Jesus will shape the way you interact with him. How you see Jesus will shape the way you interact with him. When you hear what he has to say about yourself, about the world, or about God, the way you see him will shape the way you interact with him. This is true for every relationship in your life. Every relationship is shaped by the way you view that relationship. How you perceive of the nature of that relationship will shape the way you interact with that person. You can hear the same exact information from two different people and respond in two very different ways depending on the person and the relationship you have with that person who shared the information with you. I've seen this play out very clearly in my life when it comes to fashion. When it comes to fashion, see, I myself, I have no eye for it, okay? I have no idea what looks cool and what doesn't, okay? If, if I wear anything cool on this stage, someone has helped me. You can guarantee that, okay? Someone has. A pastor, my wife, somebody has helped me out. And so um, because of that, I look for people's opinions. I ask them what, what they think about stuff. Sometimes people offer their opinion without me asking them. But one time in particular, I walked into the downtown campus at, in our four years when we only had one campus, and I had picked out my outfit for that day, and I thought it looked pretty good, okay? I had a three-quarter uh, three long baseball tee on with a, a shirt on over, over top of that, doing a little layer action. I thought that was pretty cool. And I walk in, and as soon as I walk in, as soon as I walk in, my friends start saying, dude, what are you wearing? Does Lauren know you're wearing that? Like, start asking me these questions. But I'm convinced that I look good, and so I go, even two of our pastors who shall remain nameless, who I love and respect, started making fun of me for this. And I love these men, I respect these men, but not when it comes to fashion. Because one of them was telling me, man, look at your shirt. I go, dude, you're wearing Birkenstocks. Really, you're making fun of me for fashion? If you're wearing Birkenstocks, I'm sorry about that, but it's true, okay? <laughs> I've learned that much, I've learned that much. So, but I, even though everyone was telling me, everyone was saying, man, that's not a very good looking shirt you have on right now, I'm still convinced that I look good. I'm confident if, I, if I'm anything. But then my wife walks up, first thing she says is, what are you wearing? And the next words out of her mouth, no lie, were, I need to make sure to help you from now on before you leave the house. And I was like, oh, must look pretty stupid if my wife is commenting on it. And all of a sudden I became insecure. All of a sudden I felt, oh, I must not be wearing something that cool. But it, was, it wasn't new information. It was the same information that I'd been given. She didn't say anything new, but because it was my wife, I received it very differently. The nature of the relationship changed the way I interacted with the information. The same is true with your relationship with Jesus. The fact that you know him as Lord and Savior shapes everything. It colors everything. See, most of us probably would say that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And if you wouldn't say that, you know someone who would. Most of us would say that, but I wonder if you could define it. I wonder if I asked you, what does it actually tangibly mean for Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? How would you define it? What does it mean for him to be your Lord in your life? What does it mean for him to be your Savior? It's one of those definitions that you try to define it, it's hard not to use the term in it. Well, what does it mean for him to be your Lord? Well, because he's the leader Lord of my life. Like, that doesn't work. What about your Savior? Well, because he saved me. And you find yourself reaching for words, not really knowing what it looks like for him to actually be your Lord and your Savior in your life. And if you don't have that tangible understanding of what that means, it's going to be hard to interact with him. It's going to be hard to know him. It's going to be hard to follow him. And the text for us today is going to teach us what it practically means for him to be our Lord and our Savior. So you have a Bible, go and open up to Mark 10. 
Mark 10. And we're going to see what it means for Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. We'll be in verse 32. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry about it. It'll be on the screen behind me. Verse 32. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus is walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise." The text starts with Jesus getting out in front of the disciples, headed towards Jerusalem. See, Jesus came for many purposes, to preach, to heal, to lead, but none of them more prominent, none of them more central than his coming to die and rise again. This is the most specific and detailed prediction in in Mark's gospel of Jesus' death. He's very clear, very detailed with his disciples, fellas, I'm going to Jerusalem to die to rise again. He's making it clear, I'm the Lord and Savior God has sent to you. I want you to know what I'm here for. He tells them that in the next two stories, we begin to see what it looks like for him to be our Lord and our Savior. In the first story, what we're going to see, that for him to be our Lord, functionally what that means is that he's going to correct us. That if he's the Lord of your life, that means he will correct you. Look at verse 35. Look at verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they became indignant at James and John, and Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So as soon as he tells his disciples, as soon as he tells them, guys, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. I told you before, I've told you again, I'm telling you a third time, I'm going to Jerusalem to die and rise again. They have the exact same argument they've already had, exact same discussion they've already had about greatness, about what it means to be great. So James and John, they pulled Jesus aside, and they immediately tried to manipulate him. They said, Jesus, we have a question for you. Before we ask it, you have to promise to say yes. The promise, okay? They're doing that because they must know that what they're going to ask him, he wouldn't normally grant them. I mean, I've done this before with my parents. As I say, okay, I'm going to tell you, but you have to promise you're not going to get mad first, which means whatever I'm going to tell you is about to make you mad. And so they pull Jesus aside, and they want to be his number one and number two leaders in in what they think is a kingdom to come in Jerusalem. That's what they want to be. They pull him aside because they don't want the other disciples to know what they're asking. They want to be higher in the food chain. The other disciples become indignant and angry because they want that seat in the new kingdom. And his response to them, Jesus' response to the disciples shows us that for him to be your Lord means he will correct you. Look at verse 38. Look at verse 38. And Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? He hears the request and he asks them a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question meant to to communicate it's obviously no. It's obviously no. The the baptism and the drinking of the cup is a metaphor, symbolism for what Jesus is going to do on the cross. He's going to drink the cup of God's wrath, be baptized into suffering. That's what he's going to do. He's the only one who can do it. He's the only one who can die for sin. He's the only one who can pay the penalty for sin. The obvious answer is no. But these disciples are foolish and persistent. They say, no, we're able to do it. We're able to do it. Look at verse 40. Jesus says to them, but to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but is for those whom it has been prepared. This verse gives us a peek into the relationships of the Trinity and the nature of Jesus. See, he's telling them, hey, what you're asking for is not mine to grant. It's not mine to grant. He's saying, 
who sits where and who has what authority in the coming kingdom. That's the prerogative of God the Father. I submit to him on this. See, Jesus, God the Son, submits to God the Father not because he's less than God, he's equally God, but because he loves the Father. That's, that's the nature of the Trinity. See, Jesus doesn't give them what they ask. It's contrary to his character, contrary to his plans. See, they don't realize it, but what they're asking him to do is to usurp God the Father, to not honor God the Father, and Jesus will do no such thing. Jesus will not belittle the Father. He will not let them think that their idea of leadership is proper or accurate. See, Jesus says no to them. He corrects them. And eventually, if you follow him, he will correct you. Eventually, if you follow him long enough, he will correct you. He will say no to some of our requests, and he'll correct our intentions altogether. He is the Lord. And that means we conform to him in his word, not him conform to us in our word. We conform to him in his word, not he conforms to us in our word. See, as you follow the Lord Jesus, you will be surprised at how much and how often he disagrees with you. You'll be surprised at how much and how often he disagrees with you. See, as your life comes in contact with this book, as you get to know the Jesus of this book, you're going to see a lot of disconnect between him and you. That our thoughts and his thoughts, that our desires and his desires, our actions and his actions can often be diametrically opposed to one another. And Jesus is not going to budge. Jesus is not going to budge. He is not going to relent on those things he has revered, revealed clearly in the scriptures about his character and his nature and his purposes. He's not going to budge. No matter how much you and I may beg or whine or complain that it should be different. See, the more I parent my daughter, Elle, the more thankful I am for the lordship of Jesus in my life. See, there are certain things that I will not give to Elle no matter how much she asks me for them. No matter how much she whines or complains or gets mad at me or says, gets mad at me for saying no to her, I'm not going to give them to her. See, she is about to turn two in a couple of days, and she loves to stir things. In her words, stir, stir things. I don't know why, but she loves to stir them. Hey, you put a liquid in a container, and you get a good babysitter for a good 30 minutes. She's going to stir the crap out of that thing for a while, okay? She's going to. It's what she does. But every now and then, we're cooking dinner. There'll be a boiling, uh, boiling hot water in a pot on the stove, and she'll want to stir, stir that. Well, I'm not going to let her, obviously, because this goes contrary to my nature and my character and my plans for her. I want good for her. I don't want to put her in situations where she will obviously and unnecessarily hurt herself, so I'll offer to have a different bowl of water for her to stir, she, but you know this, she doesn't want that bowl of water, she wants the one on the stove. But I say no, so she throws a fit, she gets angry, she's inconsolable. Often when I say no to her, she'll be kind of cold towards me, I'll try to hug her, she'll go, get away from me, like she won't want to hug me. <laughs> she's mad at me. And I'll be honest, throughout these episodes, my heart hurts with hers, like I, I don't want her to be sad, but nothing in me is being persuaded to give her that water, nothing. I'm not saying, well, she really wants it. I should give her the water. I'm not going to. I know what is good for her better than she does. I know what is life for her more than she does. How much more so with Jesus? How much more so with him? He knows what is good for us more than we do. He knows where life is more than we do. And he will say no to us. And you and I will hear no through the scriptures and through unanswered prayers. He knows what is best. So you're going to read the scriptures and your view on money or sexuality or sin or whatever is going to be different than his. See, all of us want to believe that, no, me and Jesus are on the same page, but you follow him long enough, you're going to start finding yourself disagreeing with him, finding yourself feeling uncomfortable about what you're reading in the scriptures, finding yourself completely disregarding what he's told you to do. All of us come to these moments we find ourselves disagreeing with Jesus. I feel this way every time I feel wronged by my wife. Every time I feel hurt and wronged and disrespected by her, I find myself disagreeing out loud with Jesus, disagreeing with how reconciliation should happen. See, in my mind, she wronged me, she hurt me, she should apologize to me. She should reach out to me, that's how I feel. But Ephesians 5 rings in my mind when it says, Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he initiated when he was the party who was wronged. But I find myself acting like my daughter Ellen saying, No, that's not fair. I want it this way. I want it to happen this way. And guess what? Jesus is not going to budge with me. He's not going to say, Well, now that you really want to and you're really hurt, I guess it's okay. 
No, he's not going to budge and say, I understand you're hurting, but this is what's true. This is what's true. I'm the Lord of your life. I know what's best. Trust me. You need to obey. You need to obey. See, Jesus being your Lord in your life means by the power of the Holy Spirit, when there's a disconnect, a disagreement, that is not time for us to doubt him and distrust him and discredit him. That's time for us to repent and submit to him. That's what him being Lord of your life means. He corrects you and you receive it as he loves me and he's good and he's wise. Jesus is the Lord who corrects us. But the next story is gonna show us that not only is he the Lord who corrects us, he is the Savior who cares for us. He's the Savior who cares for us. Look at verse 46. Look at verse 46. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, and the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. See, Jesus is getting closer and closer to Jerusalem. He's almost there. This is the last story of healing in Mark's gospel. It's the last healing in Mark's gospel. Because Jesus is heading to the most difficult and trying time of his life. And there's a blind man on the side of the road yelling for his help. See, Jesus is not on his way to heal that man. He's on his way to finish the work God gave him to do. He's not there to heal him. There's nothing more important in history than what he's about to do in Jerusalem. Nothing. So you and I could understand if he's a little preoccupied. You and I could understand if his energy level was low. You and I could understand if his stress level was high. We could get that. It's a busy day. Think about your busy days. And on, on those really busy days, we have a hard time caring for those who aren't immediately in our line of sight. I mean, think about those really exhausting days where on your schedule you go from one thing to the next. It's nonstop. You have a couple of hard conversations, so you're emotionally drained. You have someone you love in the hospital and you go to visit them and your kids are sick and there's all kinds of things going on and you still have work to do. And on those really busy, exhausting days, all of us tend to lack patience. All of us tend to lack care for people, especially those people who are on the periphery, especially those people who are exhausting. See, we, we go through our lives, and we're not going to be mean to anybody necessarily, but we're definitely not going to feel any obligation to go out of our way and serve someone we don't know. And this is where Jesus begins to show us just how great he is. Because think about your busy day compared to Jesus' busy day. Okay, we have busy days. We have difficult conversations and, and decisions to make about mortgage or relationships or a job. Jesus is about to go pay the infinite debt of sin on our behalf. He's carrying a weight you and I know nothing about. He's carrying a burden you and I know nothing about. And even though he's extraordinarily busy, even though he's extraordinarily preoccupied probably mentally, he makes time for another person. He makes time to talk to this man. See, and there's a man named Bartimaeus on the side of the road, and it's not some guy who he's known for a long time. It's not a close friend. It's not a distant relative. It's some random dude on the side of the road who's fairly annoying, who's fairly annoying. They tell him to be quiet because he's bothering them. And Jesus begins to speak to this man in a way that shows you he is a savior who cares for us. See, even after being told to be quiet, Bartimaeus continues to cry out. So Jesus tells him to come. Let me, I'll, I'll talk to you. What, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, just give me my sight. That's all I want is my sight. And Jesus, in a word, in a moment, in an instant, gives it to him. In a word, he heals him, which is interesting to think about. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to the cross. He's kind of busy. And he heals him with the word. Well, then why not just walk to Jerusalem and just heal him? Hey, you're healed, by the way, and just keep on walking. Why stop? Why stop on the most important journey in history to talk to this guy he's never met? Why stop? He could have healed him with the word. Why stop? Because for Jesus, it's not just about healing, it's about caring for this man. 
It's not just about healing. It's about caring for him. It's about stopping and talking to him, stopping and giving him his devoted attention and conversation. See, for Jesus, he wants to love this man. When all of us would feel no obligation, no impulse to serve, he reaches out. When all of us would want nothing to do with one more person to serve, Jesus invites him into a conversation and into healing and into a relationship. Jesus is a savior who loves you and cares for you in ways no one else would and in ways no one else could. As you follow Jesus as your savior, you're going to be surprised at how much he loves you and how much he cares for you. As your life comes into contact with the word of God, it's going to blow your mind how much he loves you. It's going to blow your mind how much he cares for you and respects you in Christ. You're going to feel lonely and weary and despaired and feel like God could never care for you. And you're going to read the Bible. He's going to say, no, you don't understand. You can't keep me from loving you. You can't keep me from cherishing you and respecting no matter what you think, feel, or do. I'm going to love you. I'm going to serve you. You're going to feel like Bartimaeus on the side of the road, and Jesus is going to call out to you and ask you, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? See, as Elle gets older, as my daughter gets older, she's becoming more and more of a little person, like more and more of a little personality and emotions and desires. I've loved getting to know her. I find myself attributing all of her good stuff to me and bad stuff to Lauren. Like, oh, you're funny, probably from me. Rebellious, totally Lauren. Like, that's what I find myself doing. But I love getting to know her. She's phenomenal. And I love this little girl in ways that I never thought I would, in ways that she probably won't understand for a very long time, until she has a child of her own, probably. I'm in love with this girl, but what it's caused me to do is caused me to act rather foolishly. It's caused me to act kind of like a fool at some point in time. We were at Chick-fil-A, and she's playing in the playground. For those of you who have kids know this, for those of you who don't have kids, the playground, it's jungle rules, man. It's jungle rules. Every man for himself, okay? It's fairly intense in there. So I'm watching Elle play, and there's a little boy. He's being fairly aggressive. Not overly aggressive, but enough where I got my eye on his radar lock. Oh, I see you. I see you. He's watching him the whole time. Well, eventually he gets too rough, and Elle comes walking out kind of not wailing, but upset enough to come run to me. Well, she comes running into the restaurant, the little boy follows her, and he stops. And he yells at her, not in a mean way, but fair, pretty aggressive. And no one says anything. I just find myself all of a sudden say, no. And he goes, whoop, and run back to the, pl the playground. <laughs> and as soon as I said, I don't know if the spirit of God or it was me or it was being a human, something in me said, easy, big fella, easy. You just punked a two-year-old. I'm like, that's right. I punk all y'all. You know, that's how I felt. I love this little girl. I'll be a fool for her in Chick-fil-A. I don't care. I don't care. I love her. My heart breaks for hers, and that's why, that's why when she spurns me, it hurts so much. It, it hurts so much. When she's scared, even though I'm right there telling Elle, you don't need to be scared, but she's still scared. When she's frustrated and will not ask me for help, after I discipline her and she's sensitive and sad and doesn't want me to hold her, it breaks my heart because she's spurning me where she could get all the things she wants, protection and comfort and love and help. I'm here for her. I love her, and I'm under no obligation. I'll act like a fool for free. I love her. I'll do anything for her. I will do all those things willingly. And my love for my daughter pales in comparison to God's love for his people, to the way Jesus saves his people. You are going to be flabbergasted at the extent and the ferocity of his love. And he will love you in ways you never thought possible, serve you in ways you know you don't deserve, and he'll do it willingly. He'll do it willingly. So you'll find yourself like Bartimaeus on the side of the road. And the only thing in your mind will be the voice of the crowd saying, don't pray. He doesn't care. You're annoying. You've done too much. You're awful. He couldn't love you. Why do you even need him? And Jesus is going to speak up through the scriptures, through your community, through a sermon and say, that's not true. Come talk to me. I want to interact with you. You'll remember, oh, he went to the cross because he wanted to. He made promises to be with you forever because he wanted to. He is under no obligation to love you. He just wants to. No obligation to serve you, to protect you, to comfort you. He just wants to. The nature of Jesus as your Savior is it's his delight 
to show you his love, to bring you life, to bring you joy. Just a couple of weeks ago, about a week ago, I was sitting on my back porch and I'd woken up early uh, before Lauren and Elle got up to spend time in the scriptures on my day off and in prayer. It's my perfect scenario. It's quiet. I'm on the porch. I have a cup of coffee and the Bible in my lap. And I'm sitting there a couple minutes go by. My Bible's still not open. A couple more minutes, a couple more minutes. All of a sudden it's been 20 minutes. A cup of coffee in my hand. Bible's still not open. I'm not really praying at all. And I sat there and I began to realize all I had been doing for the last 20 minutes is beating myself up. The last 20 minutes, I've been sitting there thinking about how I should be better. Shaming myself, thinking, okay, if I just, I need to get right before I read the Bible. Make sure God knows I'm really sorry about my sin. See, because I would realized that morning that my life had become fairly compartmentalized, that some parts of my life I was all about Jesus and some parts he was in the background. And it hadn't produced any overt immorality, but I could feel my heart really cold towards Jesus. The night before, I tried to pray with my wife, Lauren, and I had nothing to pray. I had nothing to say. My heart was cold. And that morning, I sat there on my porch, just beating myself up, not reading the Bible, not praying. And all of a sudden, in that moment, I just felt this urge of open the Bible. Open the Bible. I opened it up, and I was in Leviticus, so I'm like, this ain't going to go good, you know? <laughs> God speaks through Leviticus. I open up Leviticus and I see God instituting laws and regulations and commands so he can be with his people. That they, it hit me, they didn't make these things up. God gave them to him because he wants to be with them. And then it hit me, oh, I didn't pursue the cross. Jesus pursued me. He went to the cross so he could have me and be my savior. And in that moment, the Spirit reminded me that on that patio, God was there not looking at a disgraceful sinner, but looking at a cherished son. That he saw Jesus when he saw me. That Jesus had served me. Jesus had been perfect where I had failed. He had died for me. And in that moment, I wasn't some annoying, distant relative. I was his cherished and respected son. And in that moment, when you experience the love of God, it's, there's nothing like it. The awe that was in my heart, the refreshing that came to my soul was like no other. See, he is a savior who cares for you and loves you in ways you wouldn't care for you and you wouldn't love you. He is a savior who cares for us. This is normal Christianity. Normal Christianity is knowing Jesus both as your Lord and your savior as a Lord who corrects you, as a Savior who cares for you. But the truth is, most of us, most of us know him primarily as one or the other. Most of us experience him primarily as one or the other. See, a lot of us in this room experience him, experience him primarily as Lord. We, we experience him as Lord, so we get the fact that he corrects us and he teaches us and he rebukes us, but rarely are you amazed by his love. Rarely are you in awe of his joy in you. See, for you, Jesus is often frustrated with you. He's put off by you. He's disgusted by you, wanting you to get better, wanting you to serve more, wanting you to pray more. And so what naturally happens is your prayer life becomes quick and workmanlike. Time in the scriptures become a checklist. Your service becomes an obligation. And sharing the gospel with people who don't know Jesus feels like an impossibility because it's not good news to you. So why would it be good news to them? You need to hear he is your Lord, but he's also your Savior who loves you and cares for you and pursued you when you wanted nothing to do with him. He's given up everything so you could be with him. For those of us who experience him as Lord need to be reminded that he's also our savior. But others of us experience him primarily as savior. So we get the fact that he loves us and he serves us and he cares for us, but rarely do we actually submit to his correction. Rarely do we actually submit to what his, what his word has to say. We think Jesus is cool with whatever we want to do. He'd love for us to submit or to obey or get involved or, or to evangelize or pray. He'd, he'd love it if we did, but it's all grace. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And so what happens is prayers and service become optional. You do them if you get around to it. The Bible becomes just a manual for you to have a better life. And evangelism becomes primarily about loving people and not talking about Jesus. 
For those of us in the room who experience him as savior, savior primarily, you need to be reminded he is the Lord who is wise and good, and he knows where life is. Heaven's going to be amazing because we'll finally obey him all the time. We'll finally obey his word because he knows where, where, truty, where, where truth and beauty truly are. He knows where those things are. But lastly, I wonder if you've experienced him at all. I mean, really, have you experienced him this past week? Have you interacted with him at all? Have you experienced him as Lord or Savior? I think the, the haunting truth for a lot of us is we don't experience him as either. He's just a guy in the distant background of our lives. And you're missing out. See, if you miss out on knowing him as Lord and Savior, you miss out on everything. You miss out on everything. You could get all this church has to offer, all the city has to offer, all that life has to offer. And if you don't get to know Jesus, you've missed everything. Because no one else is as wise as him. No one else loves you like he can. If you miss out on him, you miss out on life. If you miss out on him, you miss out on normal Christianity. Let's pray together. Father, we don't want to miss out on Jesus. God, he is the one we were made for. He is the one who loves us like no one else can. But God, we have to confess that how often he's in the background of our lives. God, how often he's a caricature of what he actually is in your word. God, would you make us a church who loves Jesus above all things, who loves him as our Lord and we trust him and we submit to him even when we don't understand, even when it feels like he's being mean, because we know he's good and he's loving that we would love him as our savior who serves us and cares for us and pursues us. That we would love him as both. That you would remind your people this morning, even if we're far from you, even if we're distant, God, you're not. Holy Spirit, you're not distant, but you're calling every person to know this Jesus, to embrace this Jesus to love this Jesus. God, make us a people who can't be quiet about him. Make us a people who are faithful to him. Make us a people who are passionate about him. God, and make us a people who exalt his name to the highest place. God, we ask these, these things in Jesus' name, amen. Church, let's stand together.